Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Maria Sorreo from the Staples Center. Now we've got so much on the show today, including Willu Pardis, who will be joining me in just a few minutes. He is going to introduce us to two of the Clipper Spirit dance team members. As you can hear behind me, we're pre-game here at the game, so lots of noise and action going on. Speaking of action, we're going to take you into the locker rooms for both teams, the Clippers and the Lakers, and I am going to talk some off-season baseball. We've got some big news for you there as well. And finally, I caught up with Dwight Howard and met a world piece at a charity event that reminds all of us just how important it is to give back. So much more coming up, so don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. All right, I am here with Norm Peters now. Norm probably looks familiar to a lot of viewers because you've made the peanut butter and jelly dance pretty famous at Angel Stadium, Norm. Yes, for some reason they uh, decided to make that important yes. that they caught me up in the press box one time just kind of grooving a little bit to the music that was being played and somehow it was to the peanut butter and jelly song. So uh, all of a sudden I find myself uh, on the big jumbotron. That's it. Like every oh night, not just now and then, pretty much every Angel game. Yeah, and I still can't figure that out. And then towards the end of the season, to finish it off, they came in with a banana suit. And I ended up, I'm supposed to be a professional working with Fox Sports Net Prime Ticket doing Angels baseball. You know, with Victor Rojas and, and Mark Gubiza. And then now, right next to them is this guy in a banana suit who uh, uh, somehow was doing the peanut butter and jelly dance, and all of a sudden I hear a big roar, and I look and, oh, geez, they put it on the jumbotron. You know what makes our job more fun, doesn't it, Norm? You have to have fun in this business, and I think you do, I do. It's uh, We're blessed to be able to be doing something that's so enjoyable like this. Now, Norm, you do stats with the Angels, the Dodgers, the Clippers, the Lakers, the Kings, pretty much all the L.A. teams. Yeah, it's uh, my. I guess my uh, main interest would be the uh, Angels because I, I work with the, the TV crew, and then here with uh, Ralph Lawler and Mike Smith doing Clippers, which I really enjoy. You know, working with them. Yeah, they're so much fun to work with, and and both the Clippers and the Angels have been so nice to me. You know, allowing me to you know do a lot of things you know with them, and also for you know uh, a Fox Sports Net and Prime Ticket. You know, they've been great. So. Yeah, this is uh, when I go to work, I'm coming to an arena or a stadium, so... Uh, Not too bad. I kind of like that deal. Good. Yeah, I like that deal a lot. Now, Speaking of deals, we have some new things to tell you about with the Angels. Unfortunately, Tori Hunter is not going to be with the Angels when we start back up, which makes me sad, but we wish him well in Detroit for sure. You know, this is kind of a double whammy for me because I'm from, like, Minneapolis, and I'm a big Minnesota Twins guy, and then all of a sudden, oh, Tori's not with the Twins anymore. That broke my heart, but then all of a sudden I was happy because he came to the Angels. And now Tori is such a nice person, not only a great ball player. He's a wonderful human being. And uh, for most of us media afterwards, when we have to get interviews, whether the Angels win or lose, Tori is always there to give us the quotes we need and everything. He is so nice. We're going to miss him. We're going to miss him, but when Detroit comes, of course, we're going to be in that locker room every second. You know that. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> Detroit will probably get more exposure, you know, that weekend than when the Angels, you know, would be. But, uh, yeah, we miss Tori. Somebody so. else that we really love at the Angels that I had a chance to sit down with last year is our good friend Ed Munson, who is the official scorer. Great guy. Oh, I love Ed. We always sit down, and, you know, before each game, we have a little bite to eat and chit-chat together. Norm, interesting story. Everybody that comes up to me and finds that I'm a reporter, they say, how do I get to be the official scorer? And I was like, that is so interesting to me that everybody wants that job, but I don't think they really know what it entails. No, there's an awful lot that goes. I mean, uh, Ed Munson is a very talented man. And uh, he has been with the Angel organization for eternity. He worked as public relations with the Angels. And he knows his stuff. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's a pleasure to be able to, to know Ed and to, uh, you know, to work alongside him. Well, we're going to get to know him even a little better. You're going to get to know him coming up right now. Norm, thanks for joining us. My and, pleasure, uh, Maria. We'll, we'll see you for the peanut butter and jelly real soon. Hi. Well, okay. I can't wait for that one. When I first started doing this job, I had more people come up to me and say, 
how do I get to be the official scorer? So that's why I was kind of fascinated to think about what you do and how you got your job. How did you become the official scorer here at the Angels? Very interesting. Uh, in the 70s, I was with the Angels, uh, publicity director and traveling secretary, but I was working for ABC Sports with Don Drysdale. We toured the country doing football games. Okay. And he said, you need to get back into baseball. So in 1980, uh, uh, it was Peter, not Peter Bavese, but was, uh, Bavese, uh, was looking for a score. And so Don said, well, I've got the guy for you. So that started in 1980, so I've been doing it ever since. Okay. Now, did you have to learn how to score? I mean, everybody kind of scores a little bit different, but is there just a, is there a process that all scorers have? or? No, everybody's different. I mean, if you see uh, uh, books that are written on how to score, it's whatever uh, typography that you want to put down there, the lines or the circles or the X's or the O's, whatever you want to do, as long as you can keep track of what's going on. Okay, we're going we're to go back to that in a minute. Now, you came here in the beginning, though, working in PR and as a traveling secretary, and Gene Autry interviewed you. I have to ask, what did he ask you? What kind of questions did he ask you? Well, he, I was going to go to medical school, and so he said that, uh, you know, I'm looking for a guy to come in here and help us in the publicity department. And so we went to lunch, and he said, you know, if you're interested, you know, I'd really like to have you come over here to keep an eye on the old guys. So I was a very young guy, and that's how it started. He hired me on the spot. Now, what was it like back then working directly for Mr. Autry and, and just working in baseball? What was it like back then? Well, it was much different. You had uh, two or three people in one department handling publicity, public relations, and in this case, marketing promotions. And it was very difficult, but it was not the media attention. It was not the technology that we see today. So it is much different today than it was back then. You got the job here at the Angels. I know you also score for the Dodgers. There, there are very few people that do this. When you all get together before a season starts, what kind of things do official scorers talk about? We've actually only met one time that I know of, and we met in New York this past February, where we actually had all the scorers at one time in the same room. And it's really to talk about the rules, the interpretation of the rules, the game itself, mm -hmm. and the other policies and procedures that every scorer and every baseball executive should follow. It was very, very interesting, but back, to, back in the old days, there was one score. Now we have two or three in various cities. Okay. And when you're scoring a game, what is the most difficult part of your job? Well, I, I don't know that there's a particular thing that's difficult. It's just a matter of keeping an eye on all the pitches and everything that's going on. Because as you can well imagine, every pitch might make make a difference in the outcome of the game. Right, and of course, every you know every number is so important for the athletes. Do you ever talk to the athletes, or have you ever met any of the athletes? Uh, I used to know them all very, very well. C certainly, the managers. I would talk to them at the first of the year and, and basically introduce myself if I did not know them. Okay. Major League Baseball sort of frowns on. I don't want to say fraternization, but it's more a case of st stay away from the clubhouse if there is something to be talked about, go through the PR department. So whereas in the old days, I mean, we're talking about 33 years ago, I knew all the players and there was more of a conversation, now there is not. Okay. Well, and it's funny because I talked to Trey Hillman about that. I said, have you ever talked to the official scorer? And he said, only when I'm yelling at him at something that he scored. So I thought it was interesting that, the, that you might have um, discrepancies or you might say it one way, somebody else sees it another way. How do you sort of fix those problems? It's interesting because there have been some players who have come up to me after they've played. Okay. Uh, Billy Sample is a good example. He said, I, I grew up, you know, and being in baseball, I kind of hated official scorers. But he was a color guy here, and he, at the end of that year, he says, now I understand more what you do. Yes. And I think it's more a case of taking it from one level to another. If you don't understand the nuances of the games, you're going to struggle. Right. Players look at it one way, and if the scorers have to do something that is, is finite to their position, like umpires, you have to live with that part. Right. You're one of the first guys here and one of the last guys to leave. Is, is your job stressful, getting everything right, or is it something you just thoroughly enjoy? Well, it's a recreational outlet. I've said that to many people when they've asked me, you know, what is it like to be an official scorer? And I literally can leave uh, something that's happened bad in the day or something that has given me some kind of a, a tense moment and come here and have a recreational outlet. So it's really nice to come here and actually get paid to watch a game. You've, you've watched many, many games. Um, you've even scored a World Series right here in Anaheim. What was that experience like? Uh, surreal. Uh, I think in 1986, when the Angels were within one pitch, I felt that, gee, I'm, I'm that close to seeing a World Series or actually being in a World Series. And when they lost it on the home run by Henderson, it, it really kind of was a, a gut check. Right. 
but when the Angels won in 2002, it was a surreal feeling because the fans are really caught on and they really were Angels fans. And so I think I got caught up in that moment. Okay, and the same for no hitters. What are no hitters like when you're sitting there scoring? You know, we've, I've scored two here. Uh, I've seen about 12 in my, my day. But the interesting thing about the two no hitters, Joe Cali pitched one for the White Sox in 1986 and never won another major league game. He was 0 4. And the other one was the Mike Witt, uh, Mark Langston combined no hitter. It was, I think, Mark Langston's uh, first start here. Uh, started out the season, and Mike Witt actually came in in relief. And it's it's really nice when you look back on it and say, well, I didn't make an error. Yeah. Nobody else made an error. A perfect game is the easiest one to call because nobody gets on base. But right. in this case, the guys walk guys or there's an error, and you just have to be, you know, full of, of the moment and know that if you've made a mistake, make sure it's early. Yeah, really early. <laughs> yes, that's correct. You know, interesting because People might think that baseball is very monotonous, but the more games that you see, you also see things that you've never seen before in a baseball game. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when, when I look back at my baseball career, which is a long, long time, I say, gee, I haven't seen that. Yet at Dodger Stadium the other day, two guys scored uh, without a pitch being thrown. One was a, a, a stolen base, a stolen base at home, and the other guy came, came whirling around third base and he scored. I have not seen that before. I've seen plays in the field that are somewhat, you know, interesting that are not in the scorebook. So it takes a little bit of an interpretation. You've also scored the All-Star Game. What was that like? Was that was it more fun? Is it very similar or? Very similar to a postseason game. I've done, I believe, uh, 30 or 40 postseason games. Uh, I think the All-Star Game. Uh, I've done two of them, uh, 89 and uh, 2010 here. Okay. And I think it was just fun being there. Uh, I think. Pretty much, you know, guys are not going to be making errors and right. <laughs> throwing the ball all over the place. And if you see that, they usually yank them out of the game. So it's it's kind of a fun time to to be more relaxed, probably, and enjoy what the the element is. Uh, when I started out scoring, I actually had a streak of 2003 games without missing a game here, from 1980 through 2006. Now, how did you manage that? Um, actually, it's easier scoring more games. Okay. <laughs> uh, because then you get into a routine. It's like everything else. You know, if you know that there's a seven or a ten game homestand, you kind of gear up for that. If you start and stop, it becomes a little bit more tiresome, I think. You're, so you're pretty much the starter every day, though, right? I look forward to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the game now, has the game itself changed, or do you just think that, that other things around it change? Like when you were talking about the media, there's obviously more media now than when you worked in PR. Has the game of baseball changed? Uh, yes, it has. And I, I, I think back in the days when uh, players did not have these uh, multi-year contracts and guarantee contracts, they were fighting for making $20,000 uh, a year. And these guys, some of them, are making 20000 a day. And I think back in those days, if you hurt your hip, you're on the field the next day. Today, it's a little bit different because of technology and because there are other players that are gifted that are up here. I mean, everybody up here is gifted. And the idea behind this is that you look at the game and is it the players are better? I don't know. They're bigger, stronger, per perhaps. But how do you compare a Joe DiMaggio with, you know, uh, Albert Pujols? I mean, you look at those two guys and you just say, wow, they were very extraordinary. You know, and what was Babe Ruth compared to Willie Mays? I mean, different era, but two great players. So World Series, you've already done one. Is that always the goal as a scorer to, to look for the postseason and look for that victory? I, th I think part of or part of any any person involved in baseball is that you want to get to something that's beyond the normal. And so the championship seasons, as they call it, which is 162 games, I think there's always wanting to go to the playoffs to see if you can go further. And I think when players look at it, they're always looking for the ring. Well, I think, you know, media people uh, on, on all levels, especially the way technology is today, they just want to see it. I think they want to be a part of it. And I think the fans catch on to that as well. I think fans say, I was there. And that's what the players want. And, and I, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because being in the press box, you've been around a lot of amazing broadcasters like Vin Scully and like so many others. What kind of questions do they ask you about what you do to help them? Well, I was very blessed when I first joined the Angels. I had Dick Enberg and Don Drysdale uh, as my mentors. Dave Niehaus, who uh, recent, recently passed away, was, was an, a third man in that booth.
And it was very interesting listening to these guys and being on the road with them and listening to what they were doing. And the relationship remains today with Dick Enberg. I see him quite often and we uh, talk from time to time. And Drysdale uh, basically carried me along with the ABC sports crew. So it was nice getting into a, you know, a Learjet flying somewhere and then flying back. And we were doing football games. It was, it was great, but he was really the one who you know, brought me back here. But you talk about other announcers. I mean, Harry Callis and uh, Ernie Harwell and Mel Allen and to understand that these people are just as much a part of baseball as the players and the media people, the Jim Murrays and, and some of the other people who have come and gone, uh, really remarkable. And I've really enjoyed that, talking and being around them. So the press box is sort of your home away from home, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I can have a bad day, as I mentioned, and come out here and be in another world. It's, it's like going to a movie, and you see the movie and then you step back. And you don't really have to, you know, put any pressure on yourself. At least I don't think there's any pressure on me. I feel more relaxed at a baseball game than if I were doing something at my office. And coming up next, Will Lou Partis will join us and introduce you to Brittany and Becca from the Clipper Spirit Dance Team. All right, we are back with another season, and that means more Clipper Spirit Dance Girls. How are you doing, Brittany? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Now, this is your sixth season as a Clipper Spirit, yeah? It is. It's my sixth season now. So you're one of the veterans. How is, what is it like seeing this team now? And you were here when the Clippers weren't doing so good, and it was kind of a different era at Clipper basketball. Yeah, I was here. I've seen it all. I've been here for, like, the Clippers when they weren't doing so well. So now it's just, it's really fun. It's fun to see the fans actually enjoying it. It's a lot. I don't know, it's just like a different environment, more fun and like energetic in here. It's fun. So the players are making uh, your job a little easier. I, was it was it kind of hard back in those days to get the crowd pepped up for some of those, you know, there's a lot of losing going on in the building. Um, not necessarily. I mean, I still loved what I did and like I love to perform. So of course I was always like good with performing, but yeah, now the fans, yeah, they love it. So they're even more into it and I feel like they, they like us even more now too. <laughs> So it's gotten a lot better since those uh, those those days five six years ago. Yes. <laughs> now you told me that you were uh, you were a Disneyland dancer. Is that is that still part of your life? It is still part of my life. I'm still a yeah a parade performer. So I dance at Disneyland also. That's fun. So how much time does that take compared to your commitment here? Um, not as much time. I spend most most of my time like with the Clippers and school but um disney is just more of like a part-time thing okay so this is actually our holiday christmas episode of playing the field um are you gonna get to be here on christmas day for the game i will we have a game christmas day so that's really exciting and we even have cute little christmas outfits that we're gonna wear it's <laughs> exciting i noticed you guys are having a, a, an array of wardrobe this year is that is that is that something that's come into the mix recently? well we've always had a lot but yeah this year we we have a lot, a ton, our big luggage. <laughs> well, back to the holiday, the Christmas Day game. I know you, obviously you said you're going to be here working. Is that is that going to cut into your family time, your your Christmas Day uh, festivities of, that are personal? No, not really. I mean, my family, we always wake up and do, like, the whole Christmas thing. And I'm actually, my fa I think my family is going to come to the game. So then they'll actually be here, so... It'll be fun. It'll be different. We are with Becca of the Clippers Spirit Dance Team. How are you doing tonight, Becca? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Now, this is your second season. You're not a rookie anymore. Is there any difference? Is there, was there hazing going on last time I talked to you? No, no, there's never any hazing. Maybe a few jokes played on us, but um, the girls were always sweet as a rookie. It's nice being on the other side now, being able to help the rookies out, know how everything goes. So it's nice. It's nice to kind of have it all laid out, already know what's happening. And you stepped into a situation where, like, Chris Paul was here, Blake Griffin yeah. was established. Like, you got to just come into a situation that was a really good basketball team. Oh, yeah. Very exciting time. Yeah. yeah. Um, we started in the lockout. So we first went into to the season last year being kind of like, oh, no, what's going to happen? And then once lockout was over, we were like, wow, we have this awesome team. Chris Paul came over. Um, I remember my parents right away trying to get tickets because they knew tickets would be so hard to get with our team that we had. And it's still been the same way this year as well. 
Is it just exciting the second year as it was like that first initial time, like coming into Staples Center and dancing for 20,000 people? Yeah, completely. Um, there's still always going to be the nerves too. It's each time it's more excite. Um, it's just as exciting, I would say. I don't know if I'd say. Oh, maybe this year was a little bit more exciting with the new players we have as well on the team um, and seeing how well the team did last year making it to playoffs. Um, it really made coming into this season really exciting. A yeah, a little pressure, a little more pressure as a as a veteran on the team. Okay, so you guys don't have a schedule where you work every game. You guys kind of have a rotation. You, get, you guys get to choose. How does that work? Yeah, so we have a rotation and we're divided up into four groups. Um, so groups one, two, three, and four, and there's four girls in each group. And you, so I'm in group three to make it kind of easier on you guys. So I would be off every third game. I mean, it's every fourth game, but they go one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So group three is always off the. We're back to math now. Yes. It's getting tough. Yeah. Yes, it's easier than it sounds. <laughs> and when uh, you, you have your time off, what do you what do you do in your in your in your days? During my days, um, I have two other jobs. I am a stylist for BCBG Max Azria. So I do that kind of during the daytime. And then I also teach dance at a studio in Simi Valley. So I teach and choreograph for their competition team. So you keep really busy. Yeah, I keep very busy. Hi, I'm Brittany. Hi, I'm Becca. And we just wanted to wish you happy, happy holidays. holidays. Well, we are coming up on the NBA's favorite holiday, that Christmas Day game. The Lakers and the Clippers both playing here on Christmas Day. And just as we hope, those are the two teams fighting it out for the Pacific Division. Now, Blake Griffin and Chris Paul, they're doing their thing. But DeAndre Jordan has developed quite an offensive game. He's surprising a lot of folks in the NBA. Also, Jamal Crawford, he has not started one game for the Clippers, but he is leading the team in scoring. Definitely fighting for that Sixth Man of the Year award. Now, this is a team of diversity, and they cover the whole spectrum as far as offense, defense, block shots. Right, These guys hustle. Let's talk to some of them in the locker room right now. Yeah, I mean, like, if we come out and play, uh, I don't think, I think the sky's the limit for our team. Uh, tonight it was just different people's nights, and tomorrow it may be something totally different. Um, so if, if we just continue to play like we did tonight and everybody's on the same page and everybody's all in, then I think we'll be fine. We are here with Matt Barnes. Matt, that was quite a game tonight. I want you to just talk a little bit about your teammates and your game tonight because it was off the hook. Uh, you know, I just think we stepped up tonight. You know, when we play hard, we're a tough team to beat. You know, <laughs> a game like tonight really makes those last two losses hurt, you know, because it shows when we come out and play hard, we can beat anybody. Is this a better offensive, defensive scheme for you personally as a player to play in? Yeah, I mean, I think any time, you know, especially with this team, if we can, we can stop people and get rebounds, no one in the league can run with our team. But I think, you know, it, it's a gift and a curse because, you know, if we don't get those rebounds, we're going to be in trouble. So we got to continue to stop people, get the rebounds, and then get on the break. This looked like the team that we saw in the first two games and obviously the next two not so well. What do you think was the biggest difference? I just think inconsistency. You know, you can't get up for big teams and you know take other people for granted you know if you, we proved if you don't show up to play you can get beat by anybody so uh, we just got to be more consistent how are you feeling out there I feel good I feel good I mean um it just kind of feels good to get out there and run around a little bit I'm trying to just kind of get my legs back under me and you know feels good though you kept using the term game shape how close are you to being where you want to be I'm, I'm a ways away I'm a ways away I mean I'm in good shape I'm in good shape and you know, of course, I'm playing kind of limited minutes right now, and I'm fine with that. And I just kind of work my way back up. Is it almost like riding a bike to just go out there and say, I, I know what this feels like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I stay sharp just because I'm, I'm so in tune trying to help and watch the guys from the sideline when I wasn't playing. So I've stayed fairly sharp as far as being ready and knowing what's going on. But um, there's nothing like a game. What was the biggest thing that you noticed when you were watching them from the side? Well, I mean, I just kind of feel like, um, you know, the, some of the things that I do as far as leading on the floor and how I talk on the floor and just my ex experience, I think, was, was missed. Um, and I could say what I want from the sideline, but I can't actually do it. It's, and it's hard to have an effect like that, but just try your best. 
Well, there's no doubt this has been a very strange start of a season for the Los Angeles Lakers. Mike Brown started as the coach. Of course, the team had a very slow start. They fired him. Bernie Bickerstaff was the interim coach. And then when we thought we were getting Phil Jackson back at the 11th hour, it was announced that it was going to be Mike D'Antoni who was coaching the Lakers. And that is who is coaching the Lakers right now and doing a pretty good job. But enough from me. Let's go into the locker room and talk to the players. With the coaching changes in the last couple of weeks with Mike coming in and Bernie still being here, how is that transition working out? It's going well. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, Mike is dealing with his injury a little bit, uh, but Bernie's been great, you know, you know, great motivator with us. And again, you know, just, <laughs> uh, you know, giving us the freedom to go out and just play our games. Bernie's hopefully going to stay. Is that what you're hearing as well? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, Bernie's a great, I love Bernie. So, I mean, if they, I'll, I'll be disappointed if they let Bernie go. <laughs> It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting uh, uh, where um, where we're going to be positioned and, and and how we're going to get uh, production out of our guys and how do you, how we're going to make the system work and what kind of adjustments he's going to make to the personnel and 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 what kind of adjustments we're going to have to make to uh, to play um, his system. So um, I look forward to you know have fun and uh, learn it quickly and uh, execute it quickly so we can be. Um, continue, uh, continue in the right way, in the right path, and winning games. It's pretty cool. You know, I think he's a great guy. I think he's going to be a great coach for us. Uh, and we just got to play. You know, that's that's the biggest key for us is just go out there and play, no matter who the coach is. Um, stay together. You know, uh, fight through these tough times, and uh, we'll, we'll overcome. We're just going to have to play basketball, find ways to uh, to get everybody involved. And at the end of the day, we're the guys on the court. You know, we have to make a decision and play. And we're still learning each other's game. We're still gelling. Uh, we're finding our spots, you know, how to pass the ball to certain guys, you know, certain things. And that, that comes with time. All right, since it is the holidays and it's a season to give, I caught up with Meta World Peace and Dwight Howard at a charity event. He actually surprised some big brothers and little brothers. Let's take a look. Well, this is this is more important than anything we can ever do on the court. You know, uh, at the end of the day, we can win as many games and do all that stuff, but if we don't impact our community and the places that we we travel, you know, off the court, then basically uh, we haven't really done our job. You know, we have a a very important task of bringing communities together, and you know that's why they come to games. You know, they they come to see us play, and for that too. Two and a half hours, they get an opportunity to forget about everything that they go through at home and just have fun. And now we have an opportunity to step off the court and uh, be a blessing to, you know, kids and, you know, anybody. You know, so we, we, uh, we, we should take this very seriously. So Big Brothers Big Sisters is the oldest and largest mentoring organization in the whole country. And we're one of uh, those organizations here in Los Angeles. And um, kids and moms and parents hear about the program through people at school or word of mouth or their neighbors. Um, it's, it's a hundred year old program so people know about Big Brothers Big Sisters. So we don't have any problem recruiting kids for our program. We've got uh, over 500 uh, this year that are matched with a big brother or big sister and another 370 today are waiting. The boys wait longer than the girls. Sometimes the boys wait up until a year to get matched with Big Brother because it's a bit of a formula. No one's a number on a list. So not only do we have to find people out there to be Big Brothers and Big Sisters, but they have to fit the preferences of the child and the parent. And then the child and the parent have to fit their preferences and they have to kind of live nearby so that it's not inconvenient because Bigs see their littles about twice a month for about two to four hours at a time. They go to their home, they pick them up, they say, hey, today we're going to go bowling, or we're going to go to a car show, or we're going to do scrapbooking, or we're going to do whatever. We're going to, you know, Matt and Thomas, Matt lives by the beach, so he likes to take them out to the beach, and they play volleyball, or they watch volleyball tournaments. What do you look for in a mentor? Someone who is committed and wants to do it. You know, our volunteers come in all shapes and sizes, all walks of life, from 18, and our oldest current, uh, active volunteer is 82 years old. And he was named Big Brother of the Year for the whole country last year. And he's matched with 14-year-old uh, Joseph. They've been matched for four years. 
So lots of kids out there waiting for the big brothers and the big sisters, and how can they get involved? They can get involved by contacting us. They can become a big. They can become a big for the day if they've got a group of volunteers or a company, and they're not ready to do the one-to-one -one for at least one year. They can kind of start off as being a big for the day. Sometimes we have groups that host hiking um, excursions, or they go, they'll go to the Grammy Museum, and they'll do an activity for the day. And then that's kind of like their foot in the door. And that's either they could just do it once a year, or after they do that, they say, hey, I met this cool kid. This isn't that bad. I had a good time being a kid again, like Matt said. And then they will go the next step. But we also have people that join us, uh, young professionals that join our junior partners program, and they help put on events. And we have companies that sponsor families for the holidays. So there's lots of ways to get involved. If you just contact us, we'll kind of give you the options and we'll plug you into what's right for you. So we're here with Matt and Thomas. Now tell us um, about how you got involved in Big Brothers and why you're here tonight. Uh, I got involved with uh, Big Brothers uh, about a year ago and um, I had seen it a couple things online about the, we uh, about the program um, and uh, I know they really needed some male mentors and had a lot of male figures that needed a positive role model in their life so that's why I decided to uh, step up and help Thomas out over here. Okay, how long Thomas has Matt been your big brother? Well we've been big brothers since um, January 2012 on New Year Year's I believe. Wow. Now, what kind of things y'all do together? We go to the beach, go to a whole lot of places and always have fun. Okay, now Matt, I need to know what you've learned from Thomas. I'm sure you've taught him some stuff, but he's probably taught you a few things. Uh, he actually has taught me a lot. Uh, art appreciation, one of them. Uh, how to be unconditionally loving is another one. Um, and just enjoying the little things in life and uh, learning how to be a kid again. for today's show. Thanks so much for joining us and make sure you're here next time when Will and I are going to take a look back at some of the biggest sports stories in LA in 2012. I'm Maria Soreo for Will Lepardis and we'll see you next time.